breathe on me the breath of God. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them. Step by step, he explained. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John, baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying that God has given to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Friends, as you're able, would you stand as we affirm our faith today? It's with some readings from uh, the Romans, the letter to the Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. no. In, all In all things, we're more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. you may be seated as we prepare to pray together we'll sing the spirit of the living god i think we're going to sing through it maybe more than once i'm not sure whatever aj leads Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Breathe on us the breath of God. Make us, hold us, guide us. As we gather together in your name, remind us of the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, not the power that just lets us pay our bills. But the power of the Holy Spirit that lets us, allows us, that gives us the power to go into the world and take the Word of God to those who are outside of the circles. Those who are in the margins, who lay on the edges. And you know, sometimes God, we do that with preaching, and other times we do it with adult education, with health care with the ability that we have to go into the world with filled and dispensing love, mercy, and grace in spite of the offerings of the world. Now God, we know that that's a challenge. We're much more comfortable with thinking about you as a God created in our own image that loves what we love, that likes what we love, that wants to do what we want to do, but God, you called us to break down those fences, to break down those barriers, to go where others don't go, to offer the love and mercy and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, much like Peter experienced, even to the Gentiles, even to those people whom we disdain. So God, the question is, how do you do that? How do we go into a world that's so hostile and angry with the love and mercy of Jesus Christ? Well, you've given us a few opportunities. We frequently have supported Methodist Children's Home. We contribute to our connectional giving. We participate in the kingdom work, even though we can't personally do the work. Organizations we have like UMCORD, 
friends we have like Bill and Kim Nash, they reach out to those that are on the margins, those CPS kids, those people that just haven't had the opportunities that we've had. So mold us. Make us. Into the image of Christ as we reach out into the world and love. God, we know it's not easy. We also know you didn't suggest it, but commanded it. So today we submit ourselves as living sacrifices to sometimes give up what we want in order to do what you want. We pray for families that have lost loved ones. We pray for a solution and a correction to the violence that is so rampant. We're horrified by what we see in the news. But give us the resolve to go into this world as children of God, adopted into your family, and now part of your family, as we pray, as we preach, as we read scriptures, as we live our lives. We're thankful for Jesus Christ and his ultimate sacrifice and so many things that he has taught us as well as commanded us to do. Sometimes we just don't know how to respond. Even the disciples didn't. And they said one time to Jesus, how do we pray? And he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear from the Gospel of John, we'll sing, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. As you're able, would you stand and remain standing for the reading of the Gospel? Click on that. 
There you go. Now there's no conflict. <laughs> so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking all, I'm not, I, <laughs> I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fill the scripture. The one who has ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now, for before it occurs, that when it does occur, you may believe that I'm he. Very truly I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him and asked Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to him, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you're going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse. Jesus was telling him, but what we need for this festival, or what he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. You can put it back on now if you want to. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little while longer, and you will look for me. <coughs> As I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, and you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Be so this last part of it where he says... Uh, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. There's a period. And then he says, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciple if you have love for one another. So I entitled this message today, You Love Like He Loved. So we read from Acts. Peter, who was the uh, traditionalist, if you will, he had never, according to Peter, never eaten anything that was profane. He had never been a part of anything that was profane. And, and he had a vision from God that anything God made was God made, and Peter shouldn't decide what's profane and what's not. you got to realize that these guys didn't eat anything that was on that sheet. <laughs> they didn't eat animals with split hooves. They didn't eat lizards. They didn't eat snakes. They didn't eat reptiles. They didn't eat any of that stuff. They were very fixed on what was orthodox and what was okay. And God came along and said, you need to go and take the word of God to the Gentiles. Uh, friends, I don't know who you would think of right now that's the most despicable either lifestyle or person you can think of. And basically what Jesus is, being, is, is through, through this vision is telling Peter is that's who you need to take the word to. The people that you don't like, the ones that you think are wrong, the ones that don't agree with you theologically, that's the ones you need to go and take it to. Now, I could make a list, but I'm sure you've got one in your head already. You know, people that are doing stuff that we don't like, people that are committing crimes that we don't like, people that are just living lifestyles that we don't think are right. I laugh sometimes as a recovering alcoholic. I was, many years ago now, was in Pittsburgh at an order of St. Luke retreat. 
Uh, it's a bunch of people. Some of them are Methodists, some of them are Episcopalian, some are other things. And so we, I, when I got ready to go to that first retreat, I told Kathy, I said, this is going to be great. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to relax. And I'm going to hang out in my little room. It was a monastery, so the room that they had had a little single bed, had a little bitty table, like a desk, had a cross on the wall, and had a Bible. That was it. There was no internet, nothing. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to relax. Man, I went to that place, and they had early morning prayer at daylight. They had mid-morning prayer in the middle of whatever we were doing. We'd stop and pray. We had noontime prayer, and then we prayed to eat, and then we had mid-afternoon prayer. We had night prayer. I prayed more in that week than I'd ever prayed in my life. <laughs> It was hard work. It got to be evening, and we had our last, we were going to have late night prayer, but we had a break. Late night prayer was like at 11. And so I'm hanging out in my room, and I have my little computer there, and I had a CD-ROM in it, and I'm watching a movie, and I get done with that, and I go out looking for everybody and see what's going on. Usually they gathered in the kitchen or somewhere and somebody had a guitar and they were singing. There wasn't a soul in the building. Nowhere. So I went back to my room and went to sleep. Next morning at breakfast I said, where did y'all go? Well, we went down to this pub. And knowing that you're a recovering alcoholic, we didn't want to take you to the pub <laughs> because you might have drank. And I said, dude, if I was going to drink, I'd have gone across the street to the 7-Eleven and bought some booze. I, I, you left me out. They decided on their own what I needed and what I didn't need. <laughs> have we ever been guilty of that? Yep. We decide what other people ought to get, what they ought to not get, and we don't realize how it leaves them out of community. These scriptures today are big ones for what the church ought to be. Our district superintendent, I'm on the district leadership team, and he has given us each a book to read, and it's what's next for the church. Well, we all know that the church is in transition. We know we've got to figure out a way to reach those people that we don't know. Some of that I think we do with events like we're going to have Friday night where we just invite people to come up here and have a good time. Trust me, the message of Jesus Christ will be given by Bill and his music. It'll happen. It'll be church. But we don't, it's not a bait and switch thing. Just let them come and they'll hear some cattle call maybe by Eddie Arnold and they'll hear stories about Reba McIntyre and, and they'll do that other stuff and then they'll see that this guy that, that, uh, that I met, oh gosh, 40 years ago when I was working in and he was singing in a bar that there is such a thing as redemption and transformation. Amen. And I'm sure he'll mention it because he loves to explain to embarrass me about it. <laughs> he might even tell you I was a blackjack dealer. And it would be true. Peter has to deal with the fact that what he learned and what he knew and everything that's in his paradigm, that's a big word, isn't it, paradigm? I, I, when they started using that word in seminary, paradigm shift, I said, hey, people in Pasadena think that means taking two dimes out of this pocket and putting them in this one. You know, uh, it's a shift of thinking. And a, a shift of our thinking takes us from, from where we think we know everything to realizing we don't know much. We've been given this much of what God wants us to do. Oh, it's a lot of details, but it really boils down to these last things that he says right here when he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another, period. Now, if you were in the military... And the drill instructor or your superior officer gave you a new order. That's the way it happened, wasn't it? Just, you will go and do this now. Sometimes they weren't kind enough to explain. But Jesus was kind. And he went on to say, just as I loved you, you should love others. How did he love us? How has he loved us? There is a reason we picked this music today is breathe on us, breath of God. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Mold me. Melt me. Make me into what you want me to be. Help me to overcome my own ego. 
and become the kind of person that you were that loved so much that you would go to the cross for people you hadn't even met yet. It's always interesting to me to think about those stories. I have had some and still have some Jewish friends. They don't really always, you know, there's, there's Reformed Jews and there's Orthodox Jews and, and, and then there's Hasidic Jews, you know, and they, it, it's kind of like anything else. you got the really traditional ones, the ones that have kind of uh, molded their thinking a little bit, and then the Reformed Jews. And uh, I used to go to lunch every now and then with Emory Farkas, who was a Jew in, in Laporte, ran the Silver Drugstore years ago. Emory was a character. He was a pharmacist. Uh, even when I knew him in his late 80s, he was still going to the hospitals and doing pharmaceutical reviews. Had to have somebody driving. Uh, he was a little short guy, and I could call Emory short. He had been a prisoner of war in World War II and uh, had the tattoo with his number and all that kind of stuff. I've talked about Emory before. He survived because he had a strong work ethic. He moved to Houston, and they offered him a scholarship to go to medical school, free ride, and he wouldn't accept it because in his thinking, there was always a connection. If they gave me this, I owed them something. I don't want to owe them anything. He ended up going to pharmacy school. They asked me to preach or to speak at his funeral. I told the rabbi that was there, I said, Emory used to kid with me and say if he was going to convert to Christianity, he'd be a Methodist. And the rabbi said, me too. <laughs> Emory was a, was a great guy. Anyway, he has a, a, a daughter and, and a son-in-law. And David, the, the son-in-law, is a, a nice guy. He's an attorney. And we used to meet every now and then for lunch. And uh, he, uh, he told me, he said, I went to Waffle House one day. And uh, I was going to eat at Waffle House. It was the only place I had to go at the time. And I went there, and I'm sitting at the bar. Everybody's been to Waffle House. You sit at the counter there. You can see the grill. He's there cooking bacon on the grill, and I don't eat pork. So I'm, I'm thinking about, what can I eat? And so he said, I want a waffle. Because it doesn't get cooked on the grill. While he was there, and he was eating, a couple of Muslim guys came in. And they sat at the counter. And he's thinking to himself, they're going to have to eat a waffle. <laughs> they can't eat pork either. And the Muslim guys looked at the guy that was doing the cooking and said, Hey, pal, would you mind cleaning the grill so that you could cook some food for us, some eggs, other stuff? They said, We don't eat pork and we can't eat on it because of our traditions, because you cook pork on it. And you know, the cook said, That's fine. Just, just a minute, I'll clean the grill for you. And David said, I was so rigid in my thinking, it never one time occurred to me that I could ask for that. He said, I learned something because sometimes building fences keeps us restricted and set aside from other people. I know that we all live in a time right now when there are certain things that we just find despicable. We don't find them any more despicable than Peter found those things on that sheet. And there's a lesson somewhere here that God says, if I made it, it's not profane. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about that, I start to think about myself and say, I haven't been very Christ-like in my life. In fact, I'm worse than that. I'm sometimes judgmental in my love. I'm much more comfortable with a God that likes what I like. How about you? I want God to approve the stuff I do and disapprove the stuff I wish God would disapprove. But it's funny, God doesn't listen to me about that. So we live in these really fascinating times when there's so much going on and so many things happening and, and we can pick and choose. I, I can tell stories to you that you wouldn't believe are still going on. 1992, I was in New Jersey. I'm thinking it was 92. I might be wrong on that. My partner was a lady named Dolores. She's African-American. She's a nurse, master's level nurse. We were doing consulting for some hospitals. Oh, there was some humor in it. We would always check into a hotel. We'd get adjoining rooms because we had work to do on the reports we had to deliver the next day. 
And then it'd get to be dark and we, you know, late, and we'd shut the door and she'd go to her room and I'd go to mine. We go down for breakfast. <laughs> this waitress down there says, Are y'all married? <laughs> and Dolores was a little bit of a card. She said, We sure are. And we have two children at home and their names are Polka and Dot. <laughs> We went to a deli, you know, you see them on the news. They, they kind of look like the, the classic cafe in Seabrook or, or uh, uh, Denny's, I think over in La Porte still looks like an old uh, building. There's one, there's one in, uh, in Alpine, it looks like a, 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 a rail car. And uh, we went to this diner and we sat down to eat. And so she's sitting on one side of the table, I'm sitting on the other. People come and people go and they won't wait on us. Finally, I went and asked the guy, I said, dude, are you going to serve us? We've been sitting there now, people have come and some have left. He said, not as long as y'all sit together. Now, I grew up in a segregated world, but I was shocked. I'm shocked to hear about things that go on even now like that. I know, and you grow up and like I did, and many of you did in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have any integration, really. And so we didn't know anything about the other people, whoever the other was, and so we just assumed that it was scary. I spent a few hours with an African-American friend of mine named Leonard. <laughs> we decided the only difference between our grandparents was their color. Because they both knew how to get a switch out of a tree and use it on us. <laughs> we didn't eat the same thing at Thanksgiving, but we had the same event at Thanksgiving. And I'm convinced that if we could just realize that we are in the human family more connected than we are disconnected, maybe we can fulfill this commandment and love one another like Jesus loved us. Amen. Now, if it was easy, it would have been accomplished some 2,000 years ago. It's not. It isn't easy, but it is so easy to get comfortable where you are that you don't look outside of where you are. Many of you know our district superintendent is an African American. He and I talk about this some. There's some parts of his story I cannot understand. When I was working in the hospital business, I had a friend whose name was Carolopoulos. He was a Greek psychiatrist. And no, he wasn't. I didn't want on the couch. <laughs> and uh, one day I was at work, and if you've ever been to a psychiatric hospital, every door is locked. Uh, most people carry a key around in their hand because to get from this door to that one, you have to use a key. One of our administrative ladies was coming. And, you know, like so many women do, she had a purse in one hand, a briefcase in the other. She had some papers up here like this. And she got to the door, and I rushed over there and pushed the bar to open it so she wouldn't have to use her key. And she chewed me out for help. So I was at Mykonos, Greek restaurant with, with Connie, Carolopoulos. I said, I don't get it. He said, you never will. He said, you're a white male. You're not going to get it. He said, she had to work a lot harder than you would have had to work to have the same position in that hospital. She had to cross boundaries you would have never had to cross. I think Dr. Carol Lomas has gone on to be with God now, but his words still ring true in my head. When I look at things that I don't understand, I understand why Jesus sometimes said, walk a mile in their shoes. Try to understand it from their perspective. And understand that we can't understand it from their perspective unless we communicate and talk to them and find out what it was like because we don't know. Now, it's easy to talk about that in gender. It's easy to talk about that in race. But I want to tell you, there's plenty of people just like us out of this world. And they, they know who Jesus is, but they don't know Jesus. I bet you you could leave here and you could ask every single person you saw between here and wherever you're going after church. And have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? They would say, absolutely. Do you know that his commandment is for us to love you? Like he loved us. Yeah, last night before church, a guy came in. 
<laughs> uh, he says, uh, who's in charge of y'all's security system at the church? I said, well, you could talk to me about it, but not 10 minutes before church. And he said, well, what if I told you I could give you a better deal? I said, like I said, you can talk to me about it with an appointment during the week, but not 10 minutes before church. Yeah, but, but you don't understand. You don't understand. I'm not going to discuss it with you now. So I go out in the lobby, and he's out there getting him a cup of coffee. You don't mind if I get some coffee, do you? I say, oh, no, man. We love you, brother. Get some coffee. You can stay for church if you want. What do you mean, love me? What do you mean, calling me brother? I said, you are. And I do love you. I'm just not going to listen to your sales pitch right now. He was flabbergasted that I could say I loved him when I didn't know him. Worse than that, friends, he didn't get it. He's one that happened to walk in here. How many of those do you think are out there? There was a prison warden many years ago that every day would walk through and tell every one of those inmates, God loves you and so do I. Some years ago when I did Kairos, we had, uh, Kairos is, is like Emmaus, which is a program to make better Christian leaders out of good Christians. Uh, well, I was in Kairos and we decided to give a birthday party for the inmates. We'll never sing this. Every time we sing the song, surely the presence, I think about the inmates. I hear the touch of angel wings and we would get the, we would get the inmates holding their hands up like this, making angel wings. We gave every one of them a little cupcake with a candle in it and said, happy birthday, because we don't know when your birthday is, but we want to celebrate with you today. And all around the room, there were tears, because these guys had never had a birthday cake. You see, some of the reason they're in prison is because of the way they were raised, or the lack of raising. They didn't know what it was like to be loved. I'm telling you right now, the world doesn't know either. And I know that Jesus says a lot of things. And he comes and he says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Remember that? He said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Period. And then he explains, just as I loved you, love one another. That's kind of where we are right now in the world. I think the world needs some love. It needs some, needs some mercy. It needs some grace. And Jesus has called us to be those disciples, those people that go off into the world and offer love, mercy, and grace. It's adverse circumstances. It isn't expected to be easy. But I just wonder, there's about 2.8 billion Christians on the planet. What if we got past our denominational differences and started to love others like Jesus loved us? What could it do to this world we live in? Now, unfortunately, I, I can't speak to all 2.8 or whatever it is, billion. But I can speak to us. And if it's as much of a struggle as it is for you as it is for me to do these things, then I think we need to hold hands and do it together. When I was a sales manager, I used to send people out just like that guy that came here. We found it was easier to send them two by two. That kind of is scriptural. Jesus sends people out two by two. You remember he sent them out later on. He says, when I sent you out two by two, did you need anything? Did you need food? No. Did you need supplies? No. Because he told them not to take anything. Friends, if we just use the community, the connection that we have, we can be stronger together than any one of us can ever be alone. 
And so when you get that opportunity, just know you're not alone. And if they have questions, yeah, tell them, you know, where, where I get some of my questions answered is I show up at church on Sunday. Maybe you could try that. Doesn't have to be hours. This afternoon they're doing a memorial service for Randy Comer. <laughs> Uh, Ronnie Jordan is a Pasadena police sergeant is also an Assembly of God pastor and he's kind of ramrodding the whole thing and uh, he called me and he says you know Bill Nash has asked you to pray after he sings at this event I said yeah I know and he said you know because I'm a sergeant and I like to manage people part of me would like to say well you need to pray like this but he said you know what I know you're going to do what needs to be done to not only honor Randy Comer's life, but to offer the love and mercy and grace of Christ to the crowd. He said, there's going to be people there that are just there because they got beer. There's going to be people there that are just there because there's some kind of famous singers. But he said, we have a chance to go in there with the real purpose of bringing the love of God into that environment. A friend of mine, pretty good friend of mine for many years, asked his preacher one time, said, if I'm at uh, Frank's Bar and Grill on Saturday night and I meet a guy that's really troubled, will you come over there and talk to him? The preacher said, oh no. He sent a bar, tell him to come to my office. Now, I went to that place once I didn't drink. I wasn't tempted. I drank water. Every person in that place before it was over with came and sat down at our table and told us stories and talked about God. When they first opened a uh, place over in Deer Park, I ran into a couple of preachers there and they said, Preacher, I noticed you were sitting in the bar. I said, Yeah, I noticed you weren't. We have to cross some boundaries. We have to go to some places where we're uncomfortable. The command is the same. Love one another. And then Jesus says, just as I loved you, that's how you do it. Love one another. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. By now you figured out I picked music today based on the message. So we're going to stand now as we close our service. We're not passing an offering plate right now. There's a basket in the back. We gladly accept your gift, ties, and offerings. Stand as you're able, and we're going to sing where he leads me. I will follow.
Florence, uh, Carol Maples, who usually sits over here on the right, lost her son-in-law this last week. And so keep her family in prayer. And uh, Mia Terry, who uh, the Terrys, when they come, fill up a whole pew, just graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree, I believe. So uh, I remember when she was uh, baptized her when she was barely big enough to stand up. So there's some good stuff happening. I know it's that time of the year with graduations and other things. People have to be there. And let me be clear. If your grandkid is graduating or playing in a playoff game for baseball, you need to be with your grandkid. That's part of what we do as a community, too. And let us know what you're doing and how you're doing, and we'll keep you supporting. Friends, the grace of God be with you. The power of Jesus Christ be with you. And the Holy Spirit lead you so that we can go with him all the way. Amen. Amen. Amen.